The All That and Mo podcast takes actual money to produce. My producer has a family to support, and I have to support him because I'm all about that. And I am so lucky and so fortunate and so excited to thank all all of the folks on Patreon who are helping out. And I want to give shouts out to my Patreon peeps. So we're starting with the Out of Positivity Project. I see you out there. Thank you for your donations. Tawny, the mostly harmless, rad. Stephanie Chernikoff, awesome. Scott J, dope. Sarah Leslie. No, Sarah Lieste. Lieste. Lieste? Oh my gosh, I suck. Sarah, you're amazing. I apologize for butchering your name if I did. Minnow and Blossom, you're gorgeous. Meg Baca, thank you so much. Marty Wilder, amazing, so dope. Marshall Flax, delicious. Killer B, 1973, thank you so much. JP Robichaud, JP. I know you always got my back, bruh. Joanna Spencer, Jojo to my mojo, who's known me since I'm fucking like five years old. Joe, thank you. I love you. Hadera Copley Woods, thank you so much for your awesomeness, for your donation, for your persistence. Esther, you're amazing. You're beautiful. You're fantastic. DK, shout out to my home bro. Thank you, honey for supporting me and supporting this podcast. Anna Biddle, you're gorgeous. You're amazing. You're fabulous. Thank you. Andrea, doing it, doing it, doing it well. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Amy Willert, you are a fucking rock star. Thank you. Eric Meredith Goujon, one of the most brilliant artists that I know. You're the bomb. Love you and so appreciate your support. Now I move to the second tier, Liz Scott, who is a longtime personal, personal friend. I am so very fucking grateful for your support. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Scott. And to my latest and dopest patron, Healthy Life, who is in the champagne room with me. And if you ever choose to join Healthy Life, you will also receive the benefit of all the secret Patreon early releases. And as well, you are entitled to some of my time. So check out patreon.com, all that in Mo uh, or Melina or whatever the fuck it is. I don't know. There'll be a link in the description because my producer is amazing. Thank you. Thank all of you so much because without you, I really wouldn't be able to continue doing this podcast because I can't just keep hemorrhaging money forever. So you are helping me to bring the word to the world. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, first thing I'm going to do, that's just like business in the room. I am recording myself. If anyone has something they want to share or ask and they do not want it to be recorded, please just tell me and then I will pause the recording. Completely fine with that. But the reason I record is because it's important for folks to hear what I have to say and really most importantly, what I have to say to you. Because I can talk all day and all night, but the feedback that I receive and what the energy is in the room is very informative for what we do here and what we share. So I want to express my gratitude to you for letting me bring our evening to other people later on down the road. And um, that also means that you will be able to hear, if you listen to my podcast, stuff that I do. Um, now that I have a podcast and I have a place to put it, all of my talks will be there. And they're free and they're just for everyone who needs to hear me talking about perversion. So, uh, hi, I'm Alina Williams Haas. Do -do -do. I want to first just talk about how I hold classes. First and foremost, I don't expect you to have to do anything. I know for some people they were like, do we have to do stuff? And my classes are not that, you know, if you're doing a rope bondage class, it's very important that you actually have your hands on the rope, but everything I'm talking about, the most important body part that you're going to be using is within your skull. It's your brain, and so you don't have to take it out or do anything to it. It is private and entirely yours. No one else will know what's going on up there. So anything that I say in this room, feel free to take out to the world. Anything anyone else says in this room, I swear to fucking God, don't bring it out to the rest of the world. I, what I really want to do is have a place where folks feel safe to share. 
and to ask questions and to go into darkness because this is going to be a very dark topic, which leads me to the next point. If you become uncomfortable, if this is beyond what you signed up for, get the fuck out of here. Please leave. Anytime I see someone walking out of my class, I'm excited. You know why? Because that means that they're taking care of themselves and they're doing what they need to do to have a good day. <laughs> I don't take it personally because the class is not about me. It's not about me like being up here showing off how wonderful I am. I do that on social media. <laughs> but what I'm here for is to hopefully communicate with you and to you and also hear what you have to say. To that end, very few of you probably have English as your first language. If I use a phrase or a term with which you are not familiar because it's an Americanism, or I use a phrase or a term that you don't know because you're newer to kink or BDSM, I will thank you kindly if you raise a hand or make a face and be like, excuse me, bitch, what the fuck was that? I even give you permission to present it in those words if you'd like. Excuse me, bitch. <laughs> because the thing is that I want you to understand what the fuck I'm talking about. That's the most important thing. Please don't be shy. Ignorance is the sexiest state of all for the mind because it means you're ready to receive. Yeah. Willful ignorance is what I have a problem with. That is not sexy. <laughs> Having a blank slate is fine. Um, trust and believe again, there is absolutely nothing you can ask me that is going to upset me. This is one of the very few times that a black person is going to say to you, say whatever the fuck you want. And I genuinely am here for it. With that being said, there are some non, there are some, there are some people of power here today. The people of color, there's people of paleness as well. So the POPs, if you see some POCs, you are not to lean into them and turn around and start badgering them with your questions. Leave us alone. As the person in charge of the room here, I'm going to tell you, we are very tired. <laughs> we are very tired of fielding your questions. We are very tired of being the only raisin in the rice pudding at event after event. We're exhausted. So one of the best things you can do is to not fucking turn to the next brown face you see and be like, I went to this class. Oh my God. I really want to talk about it. No, please don't. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Um, any questions, comments, thoughts? I just want to make it clear when I am speaking, it is my experience, what I have seen, what I have observed. It does not apply to anyone else. People of color are not a monolith, right? And even to be honest, most of the people of color that you're going to meet here in Europe are not going to be African Americans. They're going to be coming from other aspects of the diaspora and their experience will be wildly different from mine crazy different. You know, I've had like knock down drag out fights with black Europeans because like they don't understand what the big deal about black facing is, for example, you know, and I'm just like, Oh God, I never thought I'd be in the position of looking into a black face and having to explain why putting makeup on to look like us is not cool. But you know, I quickly learned, I was like, if you are from Ghana, you don't have any particular connection to that. And this is the really important thing to understand is that we are all coming from our unique experiences in these little sacks of flesh that we're all living in, right? And so every flesh sack has its own experience, its own background, and its own thoughts. And so what's most important here is for you to respect your individuality and to know that your experience is going to be different from other people's experiences. And this is very important when you're talking about things that are considered edge play or taboo play, right? So I should define terms. What is taboo play? What is edge play? Taboo, this is an interesting thing from the etymology of the word. Taboo is a Polynesian, has Polynesian origins. The original word was tapu, and tapu means sacred. So something that was tapu means it was sacred, it was for the gods, it was holy. And ancient peoples realized real fast that God was a really good way to control. The reason that there is halal and haram and kosher and non-kosher is ultimately because these are food safety measures, right? It was not safe to eat pigs. It was a bad idea up until we managed to breed all of the parasites out of them. 
When I was a kid, we still had to burn the shit out of pork because it could probably have parasites in it. That's how old I am. <laughs> but nowadays, I'll never forget the first time I was served like a pork chop medium rare. And I was like, are you trying to kill me? And then they were, my friends were like, you know that the pork supply is safe now. I was like, is it? Because this is delicious, but I don't want to die. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So what's fascinating is that that idea of taboo and sacredness, which being something that was for God became something that was um, off limits and bad. Thanks to white people coming in and saying like, well, if it's off limits, it must be bad. It's like, no, if it's off limits, it must be off limits. That's all that means. And the thing is that there was a remarkable intelligence to a lot of things that were created to be taboo, right? Um, if you have a fishing area that's taboo to fish in, because that is the area that belongs to God, and you come to find out later, well, that's actually the hatchery where the baby fish need to not be fished. So a lot of things that were off limits were off limits because it was the best thing for the environment, right? A taboo against incest is real good because inbreeding is bad. Now, however you feel about someone fucking a parent or a sibling or a cousin, regardless of your personal feelings about it, it's not good for the gene pool, right? It's bad for the development of the species. So take your personal feelings about fucking your brother out of it. It's not good for humanity, right? And so making incest a taboo was really smart. Making not shitting and pissing everywhere was really smart. There was taboos against where you could and could not have your bathroom. And then, of course, you know, Europeans were like, fuck that taboo. We're going to be throwing our piss and shit out of the windows. <laughs> but we're the savages. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah. <laughs> you had the chin. You had the terrible chamber pots. It was a lot going on here, y'all. It's true. But like, what's great is that we can look at those things and say, this is why I'm always curious about the origin of things. I'm curious about where things come from, because then it tells you about where the thing is now. If something that was taboo means something that's sacred, something that is for the God, something that is to be used in moderation, taboo play becomes even more fascinating, doesn't it? It becomes about dipping into those places that are dark, scary, and sacred as well. Yeah. Edge play I define as any play that is emotionally, physically, psychologically, or spiritually dangerous for the player, right? So edge play is something that is psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, however you can be harmed, it's something that is dangerous to you. And the to you I add, and that's very fucking important because edge play is going to be different for you as it is for me, right? I, for example, was not, I'm not a survivor of childhood abuse. So a scene in where an abuse of a child is being reenacted, like you've been a bad girl, I'm going to spank you, has no emotional or psychological charge for me. If someone is a survivor or of abuse, that scene's going to be a fuck of a lot more different for them than it's going to be for me. And this is why I always encourage people to ask themselves why they're doing scenes. Because if what you're doing is a reenactment of abuse, I hope to God you are aware of that and you're able to also share that with your partner. Because for them to not know, for you to not know means they don't know. And if they don't know, if something comes up, if you step on an emotional landmine, you're going to get your face blown off. And I've had my face blown off and it's not pleasant, but some of y'all are hard headed and stubborn, and you're going to need to get your face blown off before you learn the lesson. And I actually support that. I support fuck ups. I support you falling on your face. I support you figuring out your boundaries by having someone roll right the fuck over them because those lessons are powerful. The things I'm going to talk about a bit later are things that were really difficult and hard. And I'm very grateful for them because I learned so much on those hard scenes. I learned so much in those difficult places, but this is what edge play is. And I want to just like encourage people to know that edge play is not always just about seeing someone doing some crazy shit. Yeah. If someone's in an inverted suspension with 200 needles in them on fire, that's clearly edge play. 
And it was like, oh, that's so edgy. But I'll tell you, one of the edgiest scenes I saw involved a woman standing in the dungeon naked as her dominant sat in front of her. And this was the edgiest scene I had ever seen in my life. And I didn't know it till I spoke to her afterwards. So edge play is unique to you. Why was that scene edgy for this woman? It was edgy for this woman because she's fat. And she had been told her whole life she was ugly. And she had been humiliated by her parents because she was fat. And she had been tormented by her schoolmates because she's fat. And she had been told all her life that she would never have loved because she was fat. And her dominant took her into a dungeon full of people. And she trusted him enough to get naked as he sat in front of her and just told her how beautiful she was. And she said she had never in her life experienced such an array of emotions. And that is edge play. So when I say it's unique and it's special to you, it's unique and it's special to you. Yes. Uh, I was thinking about that this is called in psychology, the corrective experience. Mm -hmm. When you have like a trauma or something that happens to you, which is like really bad and the needs are not being fulfilled. Yes. And you have the same experience again. And then the thing that you actually need, the thing that you want to, happens yeah. the corrective experience which you can also obtain when you have therapy for example yes and it's more intense and very effective yeah <laughs> my experience and and this is the thing is that i always a lot of people will come into the scene and be like i'm gonna fix all my shit and i'm like no you're not the thing is that this kind of scene can be very deeply therapeutic but it's not therapy I'm using two different words there. Therapeutic, a massage is therapeutic. But if you have a broken leg, get the leg set. Wear the cast, let the bone heal, then get the massage to help the muscles rebuild. Do you see what I'm saying? What we do in the dungeon, in our bedrooms, in these scenes can be therapeutic and supportive of our journeys, but it is not the pathway to healing. Do you know what I'm saying? Like there's so much that I have dealt with and gone through and pulled up and repaired my self-esteem has been immensely repaired as a result of being in a dominant and submissive relationship. The power that I feel as a slave has been unbelievably healing for me, but it's not like I'm like, I'm going to be a slave and I'm going to be better. That's not how it works. But being who I truly am is supported by therapy and meds and, you know, folks around me who know what I'm going through has been incredibly healing for me, you know? Questions, thoughts, stuff. Awesome. Okay. So what are some things that are taboo? Like, like if you think about going on any BDSM site and you think about shit that you see in people's profiles, what are like three things that everyone has that they share? Is there hard limitless? No, no beast, no, no animals. That's a universal one. What else? No. No kids, no age play. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Scat. Yes. Hoop. And here's the thing. The, and these are the three, these are the top three, no kids, no animals, no scat. Uh, two of those things are illegal. Two of those things are, I think universally considered to be pretty bad. Yes. Scat play is anything involving feces or shit or poop, right? Um, I always find it very interesting that scat play, which is not only not illegal, but just like, you know, just another form of play is listed so often with incredibly illegal shit. Right. And I'm just like, I just, I just am taking a note of that. I find that really interesting. And once I started actually meeting people who did scat play, I was like, how do you guys find each other? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, cause like no one's talking about that. And he was like, Oh, we have our ways, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, you know, one of the ways that people would oftentimes signal that they were into scat was that they were into um, extreme body worship. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're into worshiping someone's body and you, if it's extreme, if you're really into worshiping someone's body, like everything about the body, wink, 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 nudge, nudge. Right. You know, so like that was one way that scat people would kind of find each other. Um, the guy I first met 
uh, online who was a scat player. I met him. I, I figured it out because I was like, he was very lovely and wrote to me about the post I had made and we were chatting back and forth. And I said, I said, I'm curious. I'm assuming you know that your name in French means poop. <laughs> His name was Odile, which is like a very lovely sort of fancy word for poop. And I said, uh, I'm assuming that's not on, on accident. And he's like, no, I selected it on purpose because scat play is one of my things. And I was like, can I just get permission to just pick your brain about this? Cause you're the first person I know who has talked about this openly with me and I'm an educator. And like, when people ask me about it, I'm like, I can empathize with someone, but it's not my central kink. So I'd like to be able to share with people what the, what the fuck talk to me. So we had a really great relationship over the next few years. And what I realized is that like the shame that's associated with that for some people is actually part of the excitement, right? The thing about taboo is often what's exciting about it is that it is wrong. And what is turning people on is that they are transgressing against the rules of society. Society says poop is bad and carries disease and you should absolutely just get rid of it as soon as possible. But if you've ever um, taken care of a baby, you know, they don't have that restriction. They don't have that boundary. Kids will reach into their diaper and be like, because they don't fucking know. And cause babies are gross, <laughs> but at some point we teach children poop goes here. Don't touch it. Certainly don't eat it. Oh my goodness. You know, don't smear it on the walls. It is bad. It causes disease. And then from that point, 99% of us are horrified, but it, but 1% of us are like, really, I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> This is disgusting. <laughs> and they're like little perverted pigs. And they're just like secretly now that seed has been planted that all they want to do is this thing that they shouldn't be doing. And so for some people, that's what it is. It is the thrill of doing what should not be done. And I think that most of us can identify on some level with some piece of that. You know, this was one of the things that, um, when I came into the BDSM community, it was at the dawn of the internet age. And the old school perverts were horrified that these online perverts were going to come in and fuck up their perversion because now everybody had access to it. And I was like, well, first of all, I would have had a lot harder time finding you motherfuckers if, you know, there wasn't a, a, an online fucking IRC chat room. And oh my God, I'm sure you're just like, what is that? I'm like, don't worry. It's old people <laughs> shit. <laughs> like I would have never found that shit if, if, if you hadn't had access. And then my generation of perverts is looking at like, you know, um, 50 shades of gray, like, Oh, now all the news, these idiots are going to come in reading 50 shades of gray and think we're all millionaires with fucking red rooms of pain. I'm like, yeah, millionaires who use zip ties for their bondage. <laughs> Don't do that. It's super irresponsible. <laughs> it's very dangerous. I'm speaking from experience, <laughs> but that was on purpose. He did it on purpose. It wasn't, he knew that it was bad. <sighs> There's nothing like a life where you're just like, that was really stupid. <sighs> <laughs> that was the dumbest thing I ever did. God, it was so hot. <laughs> so oftentimes um, we're doing these edge plays. We're doing this taboo because it feels bad and because it feels transgressive and because it feels wrong. And that's all right. I give you a permission slip. I will write one if you need it. It's completely fine. If the reason you're doing this shit is because it's fucked up. I just want you to know that that's the why. And if while you're doing this shit is because it scares you and you have a piece of something that you want to explore, that's also fine. And please make sure that the people you are involving in the scene know that, that they are also aware that this is a possibly risky exploration. Because the thing about scenes that are edgy and taboo is that it is not just the bottom who is at risk, right? We think that in these scenes, oftentimes people make the assumption that the person who's at risk is the person who was in the quote unquote victim receiving or, um, or, or, or disempowered state, but the person who is the, uh, uh, the abductor, the punisher, the jailer, the racist, the, those people have, and I will tell you for real, a greater risk psychologically, even than the person who is being oppressed. Why is that? 
most of us are not sociopathic. Most of us are not um, evil. Most of us want our partners to have a positive experience, even if it is a difficult one. And so when you take responsibility for a scene, as most good dominance tops do, if something goes off the rails, if something goes wrong, quote unquote, then you're going to feel a great deal of responsibility for that. If, for example, you do a scene where you are, uh, you know, an evil priest and you are abusing this poor little innocent Catholic schoolboy. And after that, and, you know, and at some point in the scene, you have a memory of someone doing something horrible to you. And now you're feeling bad and you're whatever. Or let's say in the middle of the scene, you start enjoying it a little too much. You're really digging that you are this evil son of a bitch. And you uncover this part of yourself that is very dark. It can be really difficult to reconcile that with the civilized, loving, caring person that you are most of the time. And I've seen how this risk can be really problematic. So keep in mind that everyone here is equally putting themselves at emotional risk. It's not just the bottom. It's not just the submissive. It is everyone in the scene. So, you know, I'm going to talk about this later. That means that your aftercare is going to need to definitely include and involve the dominant as well. Oftentimes, tops and doms either don't get aftercare, or don't consider that they need aftercare, or don't understand what sort of aftercare they need. When you are doing scenes that involve something very heavy psychologically, one of the things I encourage folks to do is to make arrangements for aftercare that do not involve the people who are involved in the scene. So if you and I are doing a scene and you are the evil interrogator and I am like the helpless, you know, prisoner, I would make sure that you can call this person and say, Hey, I need to like decompress the UM scene because I'm not going to want to talk to you. <laughs> and you're going to maybe not want to talk to me either. So the reality is after these intense scenes, you're going to probably want to like go to your corner. So make sure that there's someone in your corner waiting for you who knows what you've gone through and knows what's going on and can support you in the aftercare until you can come back together with the person you did that scene with. Thoughts, questions? That's an interesting concept. Yeah, aftercare buddy. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, like, but... <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, I have a, I have a friend, um, and she's a, 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 a very well-known, like, rope bondage top and famous, like, evil person, and she's great. She doesn't do aftercare. This is just like when she, if you sign up to play with her, she's like, bring someone for aftercare because I don't do aftercare. And the first couple of years I knew her, I was like, you bitch, pick up your trash, clean up after yourself. What are you doing? And then I talked to her about it and she was like, I am in a feral, savage state at the end of a scene. I cannot, I can't turn around and give a blanket and cuddle someone. I just spent an hour pulling apart. So I tell them I don't do aftercare. They should get aftercare. They should have it, but it's not going to be for me. And I was like, oh God, that makes so much more sense. It's not actually douchey and cunty. That's actually like really very thoughtful. And the reality is I use that technique in a lot of situations because I just don't know where I'm going to be at the end of the scene. So often I will do a scene and come out in some new place. And I'm like, I didn't, know. whoa, we're not in Kansas, but I don't know where we are. Right. And it's really hard. And so I don't want to rely on the person who's just spent their time and energy fucking me up to put me back together. And it can be very helpful, you know, uh, definitely, definitely, definitely for scenes when you're going in and you know, they're going to be rough and you know, they're going to be difficult, but even if they don't just have someone, you know, having a friend or someone along who's just there to sort of observe your scene outside of a dungeon monitor, someone who knows you is oftentimes really good. Yeah. Um, okay. So now I'm going to do my sort of, uh, uh exercise where I'm going to tell you a story about a scene and we're going to go back and pull apart what was awesome and what was fucked up about it and how it relates to the topic at hand. When I first got involved in the BDSM community, I was living in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And the San Francisco Bay Area is very well known for 
um, being very liberal, being very LGBTQI friendly, all this stuff. So I assumed that coming into the scene, I was going to be like accepted and embraced and everyone was going to be like, you're an awesome pervert. Whatever you want to do is fine as long as it's consensual and blah, blah, blah. And uh, then I was like, great, because I have this fantasy. And then suddenly I started realizing that not all fantasies are created equal. No matter and regardless of how liberal and groovy people think they are, everyone has their limit. Everyone has their boundary. Everyone has their wall. And for a lot of people, that boundary, that limit, that wall came when it came to anything having to do with race or racism or bigotry. Bigotry is, uh, is like racism, but for anybody. Right. So if I don't like you because you are a redhead, I'm a bigot against redheads. If I don't like you because you are um, trans, you can say you're transphobic, but you're also a bigot because bigotry just has to do with um, 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 a bias, a prejudice against a group that is based solely on uh, bullshit. <laughs> right. That's not the bullshit part is not how the dictionary would define it but that is how we are defining it here today. <laughs> Thank you for asking. You're awesome. <laughs> and so like I got hit in the face immediately by, you know, by this time there were, I had met a few other people of color in the scene. I had met a few other black people and, um, I immediately realized that I had painted myself into a corner because white people were very much afraid and apprehensive and reluctant to talk about this type of play, which is good. You should be. I applaud that. Thank you very much. But other people of color um, were not only judgmental, but were very uh, cruel and felt free to explain to me that I was damaged and broken and needed therapy. And clearly I hated myself as a black woman if I was doing this kind of play because there's no way I could want to do that and be psychologically healthy. So I had other black women who were coming to me saying, you're sick. You really need help. You need to think about what you're doing and go into therapy like 24 hours a day, seven days a week and stop this. And further beyond that, not only am I harming myself, I'm harming them. So my wanting to do any type of play that's specifically focused on race and racism was harming other black people. This is what I was told. And I did not believe it, but even if you don't believe something like that, it's really hurtful for someone to say you're hurting me. And I was like, okay, well, I don't want to hurt people. So I had to get to the point where I realized that actually, A, I'm not hurting them because I'm not responsible for them. And B, why is it that any white person can do anything they want in the scene and explore anything they want to explore, but I can't explore my own story because I'm black? Like, this is how fucked up racism is. I can't even do something that is mine because of the optics, because of the appearance of that type of play. That is fucked up. And that was one of the re things that made me dig my feet in and say, you know what? No, I'm going to do it. Not only am I going to do it, I'm going to talk about it just to piss you off even more. Feel that. So I, um, the first class that I taught about playing with race actually uh, the first official class that I did was at one of the biggest kink events in the U S and it, it's called black Rose and black Rose is a group that's been around for a very long time. And, uh, it was my first national event. It was the first time it was like a big thing. It wasn't local. I was flying out to go and do this class. And I was absolutely terrified because the first time I did a small level class on this, I had uh, threats of violence against myself there was a boycott organized and uh, there were several people who very cleverly had not threatened me directly. So I could not register a police complaint against them, but had said that like anyone who did that kind of thing certainly should have their um, be taken out back and whipped non-consensually or had the shit kicked out of them, you know, but that's a general threat and not prosecutable. I'm like, very good. Bravo. You did that nicely. And so when I did this national event, I thought, okay, you know, people have an expectation of what race play is. Everyone thinks they're going to see like, you know, some evil white guy with a whip, you know, some Southern dude, and it's going to be some, like some scene from the movie roots or, you know, whatever the fuck. And so I was like, I'm going to flip this on its head a little bit. So I spoke to a friend of mine who's a Dom and who's very theatrical. And so he was the perfect one for this. And he's also Mexican. 
And I said, we're going to flip this up a bit. We're going to do a race play scene that doesn't even involve white people. And he was like, bet, let's do this. And so we did the, the thing we set up was that he dressed in this like completely stereotypical cholo outfit. Like he's looking like a Mexican gangster, you know, and we had a whole signal set up. So at one point in the class, I started reading off basically a list of, of, you know, abusive terms just to make the white people squirm. And I was like, and this and nigger and spick and chink and da, 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 da. And like, you know, beaner and wet back. And he's like, comes up, he's like, Whoa, what the fuck you call me bitch. And so he comes up like with a knife and like jumps up on the stage and everyone in the room is like, this is probably a setup, but it's really very scary. And we're not sure what's going on. <laughs> like no one quite knew what to do. So he like, you know, knocked me down on the ground. It's like kicking my ass, like pulls a knife on me, like cuts my shirt apart, like all this fucked up shit. And the whole thing took like no longer than like 90 seconds, you know, but it was like this blitz attack. And, you know, and at the end I was like, okay, thanks Holmes. The safe word is burrito. <laughs> and he's like, okay, cool. He gets up and we're laughing and hugging and people are just like, ah, and, uh, like the first question was this white woman who was just like, I, didn't even consider that race play could be not about white people. I'm like, it's not always about you. Oh my God. You guys have to center yourselves all the time. Even if you're centering yourselves because you're assholes. <laughs> I said, look, issues of bigotry being racism and prejudice is universal. It's everywhere. There is no one who is not part of some group that can be discriminated against. Everyone has a piece of this. It's just that some pieces are more visible and some pieces are more powerful than others. And then you have intersectionality. We can say and we can agree that most Western culture is being very patriarchal. If you are someone who is living as a woman, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. You add to that someone who is living as a trans woman, then you have another level of intersectionality and difficulty. You have a trans woman of color, you have another level of difficulty and in intersectionality. So it's layered and it's multifaceted. And when we're talking about taboos and we're talking about edges, we have to remember that a lot of us are living in bodies that have so many layers of oppression on them that it's going to be a big bowl of compassion needed to go in and play with any one of them or all of them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So I very rarely, I think if I sat and counted a few years ago, how many scenes I have done that were specifically race play scenes. And it was maybe eight. And that's in, you know, 27 years. And that is because, um, they are, it's not something I choose to play with lightly. It's not something that I do for fun. There are some people who do have that approach to it. It's just fun and games. That is not my approach. And part of the reason is because of my personal experience with these scenes and the fact that every time I have done a scene where I have incorporated my actual racial makeup into the scene, there is a built in sinkhole. There's a depth to that scene for me instantaneously. I can, I know I can do a rope scene and not go all the way down. You know, I know I can do a spanking scene and not go all the way down. There's no way I'm going to do a scene where someone is abusing me because I'm African American and not go all the way down. That does not mean that all of these, the all of these scenes are horrible. That does not mean that all of these scenes are damaging and scary, right? But it does mean that they can be, and it's super important that you have respect for that, for yourself and for your partners. I, when I first came into the scene, I was involved in a formal leather household for those who might not be familiar. Um, in the U S at least there's sort of subsets of the like kink. If you talk about kink as a big umbrella. And then under that, there's like, do you have a specific kind of kink? And there's people who are into like leather specifically and like the leather community and what that means. And there's sort of like a tradition that comes down from the gay men's community and that embraces like the gay women's community and then embrace the pansexual community. And it's basically based on a fetishization fetishizing leather and leatherness and also formality and structure. And the reason for that is a lot of that comes off of a military and formal household 
uh, kind of training. So the way that like in Europe, you had households and you had lords and ladies and all that shit in the U S we didn't have that. So we're like, we want that too. So we created celebrities in order to have that feeling of someone we could gossip about and look up to and as well as hate at the same time. And so in the leather community, what happens oftentimes is people who enjoy formality, people who like ritual, um, are attracted to that kind of scene. And so generally you'll find a lot of people who are doing master and slave dynamics will oftentimes gravitate to the leather community. That's where a lot of master and slave people have their sort of home. And the group that I joined when I first uh, came out in the scene was uh, a household, a leather household that was run by this one dude. And he had anywhere from three to five people who would be sort of in training underneath him as submissives. And then he had a woman who was sort of his second in command, his sort of maitre d' for the household. And she helped to train the different slaves and all this other stuff. It was all very like, you know, story of O kind of, you know, this romantic kind of idea of this household of slaves. And it was very hot. It was a very sexy thing to do for like a year and a half. And then I was, <laughs> then I was exhausted. Um, but when we were in that household, what was so great about it was that then we had affiliations with other households. So I had other people in the leather community who I felt very close with and who I bonded with. And so it was those people I first started talking to about my fantasies about doing scenes that were very specifically about issues of being a slave. Because the word slave for many people in the scene is just another word or descriptive of a role. And for me, I do not use the terms master and slave lightly. I don't even introduce Georg or as my master ever. I sort of sneak up to those terms because they are very heavy for me. Something happens in my body when I hear those words and it's not always pleasant. And so I had to reconcile that with feeling like being owned by someone was very erotic for me. And one of the ways that I got over that was to realize that if this was a desire of mine and I did not fulfill and explore that because I'm black, I have now taken myself out of this experience that might be valuable because of racism. And that sucks. And I said, you know what, I'm going to figure out a way past this because I want to explore this and I don't want to be afraid to do it because it looks bad. I don't care how it looks. I care about my experience. And so what this meant was that I had a core group of people I really trusted. And so when I decided that I really did want to do a very intense scene of playing with race, I let my owner know that this was something that he could not do because it was outside of his comfort level entirely. But there was a master in one of the other households who was in our group and he was someone I liked a lot and he felt comfortable doing it. And uh, so we had planned how to do this scene. And the first thing that we talked about was it was going to be um, like a, a, a runaway slave scene. So he was gonna be like the evil slave catcher and he was going to catch me and then like, you know, beat me for running away. And I'm like, great. And so to give a little bit of an extra spiciness to this, we decided that the scene would happen in the month of April. So at some point, I, I did not know when. And at the time, I would go to anywhere from two to five kink events a week. Um, and it would be play parties on Friday and Saturday. And so there would be, um, uh, two, four, six, two, four, six, eight, 12, 12. I can't do math. There's four weekends in a month times two is eight. Thank you. There would be eight opportunities <laughs> for this scene to happen. And I would not know when to sort of give that extra little like spiciness to the runaway slave thing. So basically for the month of April, I was a runaway slave <laughs> on some level at any point. Like, you know, it wasn't like I was sitting at work going, he's going to come into my cubicle at any moment and drag me out in shackles. But, you know, by the second week in the month, like I was walking into parties and being like, is he here? <laughs> or like when he came in the door, like at one point I found out later, he literally like came to a party where I was working. I was just working the door just so he could walk around and threaten me. I was like, you son of a bitch, you are an evil <laughs> bastard. And so, um, we had talked about, you know, 
what was going to happen to scene, you know, like limits and all that other stuff. And, uh, the other folks who were in our household were permitted to be involved in the scene if necessary or desired. So like if he needed other slave catchers, then someone else from the household might be invited into the scene. I was aware of that. And it was probably the third weekend in the month when I was at a play party and his, um, his partner, his main slave was talking to me at the, you know, snack table and I'm eating some cheese and she's telling me some sort of story about some guy. Uh, uh, you know, she's like, yeah, I heard down in Palo Alto yesterday that like, you know, um, uh, Paul was involved in this. I was like, Paul, who, what are you talking about? Like, I did not understand at all what the fuck she was talking about. And then suddenly there's like a bag over my head and I'm being knocked down to the ground. I'm like, Oh my God, it's the scene. That must've been like a signal for the scene to start. Holy shit. Fuck, fuck, fuck. So then I get dragged into the dungeon and the scene begins. And like my friend is there and he's got like this you know, chain, this rope and he wraps it around my feet and has me like, you know, against the St. Andrew's cross. And he's, you know, he's originally from the South. So of course he like plays up his little Southern accent you know? So he's like, I got you now. I'm going to, da, da, da. and I'm sort of laughing because I'm still on that adrenaline of like having just been abducted from the cheese table, <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, Oh my God. Da, 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 da. So the first like few minutes of the scene is what you would expect in a scene. Like I'm getting hit and he's like punching me in the back and like, you know, he's got like the rope and all this other stuff. And he pushes me down on the table. And then he's like, I know you saw who burned down the barn last night. And you're going to tell me who burned down that barn. And I was like, Oh no, someone burned down the barn. <laughs> and blah, whatever. Um, so the scene goes on and it's the usual stuff. And he's like, who burned down that barn? And he's calling me every name in the book. He's using very bad words. And about half an hour or so into the scene, he had me flipped over on this table. He's holding me down. And then some people come in and like grab my arms and legs so that like I can't move. And he's literally um, uh, 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 punching me in the ass. And then he has in the other hand something else and he's hitting me and he's like, you know, I'm going to beat the devil out of you, you nigger and this and that. And I'm like, oh my God, he's literally hitting me with a Bible. He has a Bible. <laughs> And he's like, I'm going to pray for your sorry soul and thing. And he's like reciting passages from the Bible. And I'm laughing because this is so ridiculous, <laughs> you know? Um, and then they like take me over and they drag me off the table and they have me on the ground and there's more hitting and kicking and all this other stuff. And then back up against the cross. And we're now like about an hour into this and it's very fucking intense. And he's using a bullwhip on me. And at one point I sort of like blinked and then we were back on the table. And I was like, how do we get from the St. Andrew's cross to the table? That was really weird. I just sort of lost track of time. And I was like, oh, that was weird. Okay. Foreshadowing. But that had never happened to me before. And my criteria for giving a safe word in the scene is harm or eminent harm. Because that's what I had been told. Are you about to experience harm to your body? Then you safe word. Are you about to experience harm to your psyche? Are you, are you, are you about to freak out? That's a good reason to safe word. Other than that, you don't just safe word. Cause I'm a hardcore bitch. Right. So now we're back on this table and I'm a little confused, but things are going on. And now he's getting very serious about this questioning and he's whispering in my ear. He's like, I'm going to keep fucking you up until you tell me who the fuck burned that barn down. And I started to get really pissed off. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know who burned down the fucking barn, man. And so he's yelling at me and I'm yelling at him. And we're just like, rah, 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 rah. And now I'm having trouble breathing and I'm just like mad. And then like, I had another moment where I blinked and suddenly I'm now hanging from my wrist from a hook in the middle of the dungeon and I'm exhausted. And I'm like, how did I get over here? That was really weird. And, um, he takes the bullwhip again and starts whipping me all over my entire body, like fucking like neck to knees, fucking like everything, everything, everything. And I'm starting to feel very disoriented in a way that I had not experienced before. And he's asking me over and over again, who burned down the bar? And now I'm just, at this point, I'm just yelling out names. I'm literally just like, Steve, John, Ringo, I don't fucking know. Like, like 
Peter, Paul, Steve, like what the fuck? I just, I'm, I, I can't even speak anymore. And I look up and at this point, there's a crowd of maybe like 60 people in a circle around us watching this. And he finally takes this whip and throws it down on the ground and out of his boot, he pulls out a huge hunting knife and walks up to me and like yanks my head back and holds a knife to my throat. And he says, if you don't tell me who the fuck burned my barn down, I will cut you open from your cunt to your throat and no one will do a goddamn thing about it because no one gives a fuck about another dead nigger. And in that moment, my first thought was, please just kill me now. Please just fucking kill me already. And he let go of my head and I was just couldn't even really breathe. And then I see someone walk up to him and say something. And then he's like, oh, shit. Oh, dungeon's closing down. We got to go. Unhooks me from the thing. He's like, how you doing, though? Everything OK? Nothing was OK. I took a swing at him and took a swing at him with my fist and my foot, ran into a cage and shut myself in it. And the whole dungeon is like, what happens now? What just happened? He's confused. He can't figure out what's going on. I like, he comes over to the cage and I'm like, I swear to God, if you come in here, I will fucking end you. And he backs up because he has never seen me do any shit like that before. Um, my dominant was gone. He had already like, you know, fucked off to the front room of the party. So he wasn't back there. And I didn't really want to talk to him either at that point, actually, because he'd been one of the people to hold me down when I ran away. And bizarrely, one of my other play partners was like the only person I would let come near me, this guy, Steve. And Steve is the most crazy fucking sadist I've ever met in my entire life. But crazy as Steve was the one person who I let come in the cage and he literally had to lay on top of me to stop me from shaking and crying and screaming. And the woman who ran the dungeon was like, that's going to be a while. So she emptied the dungeon. Everyone else went home. Um, he lay, kept laid on me into whatever he and another person, like he drove me home in my car, parked my car. And that was a lot of shit that had to go on. Cause I had driven and they were like, she is not driving tonight. Um, so I got home and, uh, I had like 79 missed calls because my friend is calling me. He's like, a mess. The guy who ran the scene is just like, cause I refused to talk to him. It was like, do not come near me. He's calling me this and this and that. I pass out. I wake up the next morning and the, every single fucking kink message board in the USA is like, did you hear about what happened in San Francisco last night? And I'm just like, holy shit, this is going to be, this is, this is the thing. Half of the community was like, he's a, a monster. How dare he? This is ridiculous. The other half of the community is like, she's clearly uh, a mess. She's clearly a dangerous bottom. Yeah. I would never play with someone who couldn't safe word if they had a problem, you know, then blame it on the top. It's not his fault. She should have safe worded if she was upset. And then the fallout began. And the guy who did the scene was like, I need to talk. He's like, I'm so sorry. We need to talk. And I was just like, no. Um, so what have we learned kids? <laughs> First and foremost, the scene that we negotiated was this runaway slave scene. The problem is what he added to it was an interrogation aspect. So this is the first thing I'm going to tell you about difficult scenes. Don't layer that shit. If you are doing a fucked up scene, make it a fucked up scene about one fucked up vector, one vector of fucked up right? If it's a race play scene, it doesn't also need to be interrogation scene. You don't need to add things to it. Start small. Don't add too many things to it because the reality is I had never done an interrogation scene. I had never considered what an interrogation scene might mean for me. And so the fact of the matter is, um, there are techniques for interrogation that are effective, uh, for lots of really interesting reasons right? Interrogation involves um, taking you out of your normal space. Interrogation involves repetition. Interrogation involves exerting power. 
Yeah. Interrogation involves making sure that the person feels hopeless and helpless and is relying on you as the interrogator. All of these things or textbook interrogation techniques used by the U.S. military and me on me in this scene. Right. I was not prepared for that. We had not negotiated that. He didn't think it was that big a deal. So let me tell you, it's a big fucking deal. Okay. So when you are exploring new things, think about how many aspects of discomfort, how many, you know, uh, 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 degrees of discomfort are in this scene. Is it about emotional pain? Is it about physical pain? Is it about physical and emotional pain? What's the background there? As an actor, there's something that I do when I get a role. I sit down and I think about the person I'm playing. I think about their history. I think about their childhood. I think about what they eat for breakfast. When you're doing a scene, do all of that. Become that character. Figure that out because that will give you additional insight into the person you're playing as the oppressor. And if you are the person who's being oppressed, think about your reasons why and where your vulnerable places are and talk about the scene. Talk about it. And here's the thing. I hate talking about scenes. I am one of those people. I'm like, surprise me, <laughs> but don't surprise me in a terrible way. <laughs> right? Like, like this is the thing, the aspect of not knowing this whole, like at any point during this month, this scene could happen was really hot for me and really interesting. And I knew about it. Right. I was prepared for that level of uncertainty. Uncertainty comes in degrees. There's complete shock, like a car accident. And then there's some mild uncertainty, like, is this class going to go well today? You know what I mean? Like when you are designing scenes, don't give yourself so much uncertainty that there is a chance for some surprise landmine to blow up. When we were in the middle, in the, in the very early stages of the scene, and there was a moment where I lost track of time. I did not know that that is a sign of dissociation. I had never been in a situation where I had dissociated. And so I did not know what the fucking signals were. And no one can tell you what your dissociative signals are because they're different for everyone. There are some common signals. Yes. Any therapist can tell you about that. Um, this is not about dissociative fucking issues, but for me, that loss of time was a signal of dissociation. And so now I know if I'm in a scene and I'm a little, I get confused about how long I've been doing the scene, I stop the scene and I check it and I'm like, I'm a little confused, but there was no way for me to know to do that because at the time I was first of all, in a chemical soup of adrenaline and cortisol and all kinds of shit. So I wasn't thinking clearly already. By the time the second dissociation came up, I was also so out of my body, which is a trick I utilize if I'm trying to take more pain than I really want to take. Um, and that's a great thing to do. And it's a nice tool to have when you are conscious, but when you are not conscious, you're doing that. That's not good because I had shut off pain receptors in connection to my body, which enabled me to take a lot more pain than I normally would have, which pushed the dissociation even further. The friend of mine I told you about who came into the cage later and laid down on top of me, who is legitimately the most terrifying top I've ever played with, bless his heart. I talked to him the next morning because he was the only person I would really talk to. And he was like, yeah, I'm curious why you didn't safe word. I said, because I wasn't there to safe word. And he said, yeah, I could see that. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you were not there. Like after the first hour of that scene. Oh, sorry. PS, the scene was three and a half hours. That's a long time. I recommend, uh, when you are doing edge play, set a fucking alarm, time yourself, make it small. Five minutes is a very long time to be humiliated. For example, it doesn't have to be an entire day when you're doing this fucked up shit, start very, very small and see how you do. It's like, you know, when you dye your hair, they say, do a patch test. Just take out a few little bits of hair and see how that goes. Do that with your brain. Take a few brain cells out and see, <laughs> how do I feel about being humiliated? Is that okay? 
And if part of your brain is like, no, fuck this, <laughs> then don't do it. But the reality is I, this was uncharted territory for me. So when Steve said to me, you know, yeah, I could see that you were gone. Like you were not present at all. I started to wonder why no one else saw that. Or most importantly, why the person running the scene did not know that because they were right next to me. They could look into my eyes. It took me probably two weeks to get to the point where I could even talk to the top who ran the scene. And um, that fact is one of three regrets I have in my life. I will be 54 in a month. I only have three things in my life that I, that I would go back and change. And this is one of them. And what I would change is I would have said to him, I can't fucking talk to you now, dude, but give me two weeks. That would have made a huge difference. And it would have been the compassionate thing to do. And unfortunately, I was not in a place where I could provide that compassion to him. I don't blame myself for that, but I do regret it. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, I wish I had because that two weeks was a buffer that damaged our friendship. Um, because he was swimming in a place of not only was I the worst of my ancestry because he came from that background, those were his people. He had plugged into that darkness and then I never came back to unplug him. And this is the power that you as the victim have. So if you are bottoming in one of these scenes, make sure that you go in there knowing that you have a check-in with your oppressor. And even if all you want to do is see them in jail or hanging from a fucking pole in the town square, tell them you'll get back to them and that they're okay. Let them know that because that will be a lifeline for their mental health. And I believe that we do owe that to each other when we are living in compassionate energy with one another. You know what I'm saying? By the time we finally spoke, I was like, dude, what the fuck? Why didn't you stop this scene? And he said, I knew that you don't do, I don't generally use safe words. And we had agreed that this scene would just be till I was tired. And, um, he thought he was very clever because he had had his slave while talking to me at the cheese table, give me the answer to the question he was asking me. So I did know who had started the fire in the barn because at the cheese table, when she was talking about, you know, um, Paul starting some fire down in Palo Alto, this was supposed to be the information I needed. Don't be that clever. <laughs> Don't be that fucking smart. Don't be cute with this shit. The hilarious part is I think I named off every single other beetle except for Paul. <laughs> and this was the thing. It was some stupid fucking name. And even though I named off 50 men's names, I didn't say Paul. I was like, George, John, Ringo. <laughs> Herman, <laughs> just skip right past Paul. Yeah. <laughs> I was in an I am the walrus kind of mood that day. So I was severely pissed at this guy, you know, and, and I said, look, you are someone who is supposed to be so good at reading people. When you saw that vacancy, didn't that panic you a little bit? He said, yeah, but I knew you would safe word. And I was like, wow. And, uh, 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 this is an aspect in all of my classes. When I teach about negotiating play, never rely on a safe word. Does anyone here know what the real origin of safe words are, how they entered the community? Yeah. Safe words started purely for role play scenes. If you are pretending to be a political prisoner, Let's say you're pretending to be a Jew hiding in a basement and the Nazi comes down the stairs, but you really have to pee. <laughs> but you can't say, ah, excuse me, <clears throat> Herr Gruber, I got to pee. 
<laughs> and her group was like, ah, oh, right, right, uh, uh, just go to the left at the door. <laughs> it's going to be a little distracting. If you just say cucumber, part of you knows that you have broken the reality a little bit. You go out, you do your thing, and you come back. So safe words were for role play scenes in order to not break the, 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 the bubble that you have created for the role. That's what they were for only. Then other people started saying, hey, it can be useful as a communication tool if someone's really fucked up and they can't use their words anymore. You know, they can't think to say, oh, can you just adjust this rope? My, you know, rotator cuff is cramping up. Um, you say yellow instead and someone knows to stop and check in, you know, um, or if someone's beating you and they're sort of stuck in that, like you want them to be beating you at like a seven or eight and they're at a three or a four, you just go green. And then they're like, all right, hit them harder. You don't have to stop and break the whole scene. And in that way, it became very helpful. And then it became the way, the way to let someone know there was a problem. The problem with that is what if you can't? What if you are so deeply within the role play or within your own mind that you cannot remember Red or Paul because you can't remember Paul because you were eating a fucking cheddar cheese cube? It's fine now. <laughs> Don't be that clever. Don't ever rely on safe words. If you are doing a scene you need to know something about the person you're playing with. You need to check in and you need to veer to the side of caution. I know it can seem like a lot to stop a scene, especially dominance. I know y'all are like, they're relying on me to have a great time. I'm responsible for them. Stop the scene. I know as a bottom, you're like, I don't want to disappoint them. I don't, I want them to play with me again. I want to be like the best and buffest masochist ever. Stop the scene. You can always do the scene again, but you can never undo the scene. You can always come back for more, but you can't have less. So I strongly advise to take this very slowly when you are doing this shit that is rough and difficult and potentially ugly. You've been listening to All That and Mo. Thanks so much for spending your precious, precious time with me today. My podcast is produced by Cody Crabb, theme music by Georg Friedrich Haas, as performed by Marcus Weiss. And I look forward to spending time with you again really soon. Mm-hmm.